Hey guys, I have good news. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And for Amos' prophecy, we see that there is hope at the end of the funeral song. Let's jump in. So this beautiful section at the end of the book of Amos is our point to wrap up this wonderful prophecy. We've seen that God has relentlessly called out injustice. He has invited Israel to lament and to move away from their broken systems and restore their relationship with them. On the way there, we see that God has pointed out all kinds of idolatries. And so, over the big picture of the book of Amos, we can take this arc and apply it to ourselves. We can take this arc of thinking and, and attempt to seek God with this. Uh, God, where are we participating in systems of injustice? Where have our idolatries made us blind? And where are we in need of being broken, of lamenting and repenting and being restored? And so with that in view, with that in view, we see now that God returns again to this day of the Lord theme, right? We've realized that Israel's expectations for the day of the Lord are disjuncted. They are a bit more optimistic about God because they assume that everything's peachy, we're worshiping you, we're fine, we're doing our festivals, and yeah, we're ignoring the needy and the poor, but when God comes, he's just gonna celebrate because he's gonna be so proud of us because we're awesome. And we come to find out in the book of Amos that Amos shows that the day of the Lord is not exactly what they expected it to be. Let's take a brief moment to look through how Amos reframes the day of the Lord as something fearful, something tragic, something that he says is not going to be a day of light, but a day of darkness. Let's take a look. Though this theme has deep roots as a day of victory, a victorious visitation from the Lord, what we see in the book of Amos is, well, it's repackaged a little bit. So let's read in Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness and not light. This is a reversal of their expectations. So let's see how Amos uses this elsewhere. We read in 2.16. He who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, declares the Lord. This is a day now of military defeat instead of victory. That on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground, Amos 3.14 says. So guys, this is a day where God is going to come against idols and the idols will be destroyed. Amos 8.3 shows that the day is going to be a day where lament will be the song of Israel. In 8.3, the songs of the people shall become wailings in that day declares the Lord God. It's not a victory song they're singing. They're singing in lament. 8-9 goes on to say, And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth and broad daylight. This day that is coming is a day of reckoning with the judgment of God upon the idolatry and upon the triumphalism of idolatrous Israel. So the refrain throughout Amos are the days are coming. And this is to inspire Israel to reflect upon what God is about to do. This is like Nineveh's opportunity to lament and repent and be renewed. So guys, as we can see, Amos is, is using this theme of great expectation of God's visitation upon their victory. And, and he's saying, oh, you think it's going to be great? Well, actually, God is coming against you because you're so out of sync with him, you don't even realize it. Amos does so much work to jar his audience into realizing that they're out of place in their relationship with God. And so when we hear days or the day of the Lord or these days are coming, well, we might get a little afraid, like God's coming in, in judgment. But then at the same breath, in the same breath, and this is so like our God, 
those days that seem like darkness that will be experienced as a as a as a corrective measure those days actually become their redemptive opportunity as well those days actually signal the light at the end of the tunnel and so let's take a look here in this passage what the days that are coming bring and now we come to our present text the last passage in the book of Amos where the day of the Lord makes another appearance so let's read from Amos 9 11 through 15 in that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this behold the days are coming declares the Lord when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. The day of the Lord is bringing good things. So let's look at the arc of this, right? What, what, what is, how is God uh, through Amos conveying uh, uh, and, and adding another level to this prophecy? Well, he's saying a, a few things. The tent of David will be restored. You guys know the tent, right? One of the scholars, Stuart, that I've been doing some research from uh, and reading his writings on the book of Amos, talks about this place, and in the Hebrew it's Sukkot, uh, being, it's actually a place rather than it meaning a, a, a figurative tent. So there's that possibility. But, but I tend to read this, and many of the translations would suggest, that this is talking about the kind of metaphorical tent of David, right? What is the tent of David? Didn't David build a house for God, a temple? Well, technically his son did, and we could review that if we wanted to. This place of, of, of worship that is tied to David's name is, is usually associated with the temple. Why would Amos use the word tent here? I think this is a reminder. I think it's connecting two different modes of promise that Israel existed in. One of Okay, so I my phone died and it's my camera, so I'm just gonna continue this from my laptop. It's so cold my phone stopped recording. That is it's pretty intense. <sighs> Coffee. Alright, let's try to pick up where we left off. The day of the Lord up to this point in the book of Amos has been a bit of Amos attempting to invite the people of Israel to check themselves before they wreck themselves, right? And now at the end of his prophetic message, there's this little section of the day of the Lord becoming a day of, of hope, that God is, is doing something unique here. He's going to bring about restoration. At the mention of days are coming in chapter 9, we have something far more optimistic than anything we've read so far. At this point, God is going to turn the fortunes. He is going to restore Israel. And he's going to do so in the shape of a couple of promises that describe both the past and the future of Israel. And it even affects the whole world. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. David's tent. David's tent. David's tent. So we, we just reviewed this a little bit, right? What, what the heck is David's tent? And this might be what Amos is doing here is, is recalling this specific word, Sukkot. It's, it means tent in Hebrew. And this was when God's people were in a relationship of dependence. Do you remember this in the Exodus that the 
Israelites had just been rescued from slavery, right? They were they were humble slaves, and 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 God brought them out into the the desert in the ancient world. Nobody was thought to have, you know, thrived in the desert, right? Gods in the ancient Near Eastern worldview were kind of limited to the spaces occupied by civilization, right? That would have been some of the evidence that they existed, right? There were rivers and and there were cities. And here in the middle of nowhere, in in a desert, God carves out a relationship with his people. Intense. One could say that the desert was intense. All right. And God actually himself took up a tent, right? Remember the tabernacle? This is, this is David's tent. This what, what became the temple was first the tabernacle. And so God himself is dwelling with them in a tent, right? So when, when Israelite people hear the word Sukkot and they, they hear this, ah, restore Exodus, relationship with God. Think of this. It's past. We're going to talk future past. In the past, Israel was dependent on God. This is a relationship of dependence, humility, and trust, which is quite the opposite of Jeroboam II's Israel, which is defined instead by self-reliance, pride, and complacency. So this is a restoration of a relationship between God and his people. Depend on God. So I said this was future past. Now we got the future part, David's. Okay, so what does David have to do with the shape of future hopes for uh, northern kingdom Israel? Isn't David a past king of, of the joint kingdom when they were both together? But something key happened in David's tenure during David's reign, he wanted to, what did he want to do? He wanted to build something. He wanted to build God's house. And God said, I'm going to build you a house. Uh, And this is actually a word play that comes across in the English too, that house can mean dynasty. What God was going to do with David is he was going to use David's line to establish a once and future forever king. Kind of sounds like King Arthur or something, doesn't it? Uh, Camelot! Excalibur! Arthurian legend does have a lot of, you know, Christological notes in it. Um, anyway, any, any uh, medieval nerds out there? Oh, we're going to flash back all the way to Second Samuel, the second book of Samuel, chapter 7, if I can find it. Never forget, I acted this scene out in amazing form in my devotional on Psalm 132. I mean, this reenactment of 2 Samuel chapter 7 is probably my greatest theatrical cinematic accomplishment of all time. So please go back and review that if you like. It's pretty great. God is speaking through the prophet Nathan and he tells David after David says, I want to establish a house. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one uh, who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men, but my love will never be taken away from him. And as as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever. Before me, your throne will be established forever. So let me get this straight. We got the past. We got this relationship with God, this tent kind of relationship, this throwback, uh, dependence, humility, trust. And now we have this combined with David, which draws to mind the future hope of Israel, that one day there would be a king who would somehow be God's son, who would reign forever. Is anybody starting to think it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas? Indeed, it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas because what's happening here at the end of Amos is 
the shape of, of future hope is coming into focus. And what does it mean? What does this future past promise, the, the, the raising of, of David's fallen tent, this past relationship, this tent reminder of dependence, and this future hope of, of eternal and even global redemption, it affects the whole world. Back to Amos. <clears throat> And that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be. It's God doing the building, God doing the replanting, the rebuilding, the restoration, so that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations that bear my name. Guys, we know from the table of nations back in, in Genesis, right, that, that all of the nations are, are part of the family of God. And so what we have here is this redemption, this restoration of a past dependent relationship on God that, that will take shape in a, in a future coming king who will be the son of God. It will affect the world. That is some amazing light at the end of this tunnel. And it's starting to sound like a Christmas carol. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature. Come on, sing it with me. Sing. I, I couldn't resist, right? It's, it's just exciting to read this stuff. And, you know, it all points to what Christ has done and what he's going to continue to do. So, so guys, I, I think it's only appropriate if we fixate on this hope and how Christ fulfilled it. So let's read a very familiar passage for the season we find ourselves in. Okay, this is Isaiah, another prophet. Right? Prophets, they bring the heat, they announce the injustice, they invite people to repent, but they also show how faithful God is even during these times and how he is shaping and moving things towards his redemptive goals for all of humanity. Chapter 9, verse 6 of Isaiah. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So guys... We've been soaking in Amos' diagnosis of the injustices in northern kingdom Israel. We've been attempting to diagnose our own injustices within our context in 21st century America, including within the church. And so, hear this. The government we're looking for, the king we're looking for, it's not going to be found in some Jeroboam the second type figure who's going to have the best kind of politic and the best kind of national pride and, and, and whatever he's going to do to make our place better. The only person we're going to find this kind of justice that Amos is seeking is in the person, the character, the nature, and the ministry, and the kingdom of Christ Jesus. So guys, all of this soaking in trying to, to, to realize that God is interested in a better society, we must now realize that what God wants to do in Christ is to help bring that into the world through his church body. May we be agents of this king. May we be loyal to his kingdom first and foremost. And so as we pledge allegiance to and are knighted and, and as we are knighted 
And as we are knighted, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Just. Okay. Okay. As we are, as we are knighted. As we are knighted. Oh! <laughs> as we are knighted into the kingdom of God. We get to represent the interests of this amazing king. Don't sell your identity short for anything, for any other narrative than this one, right? This is the narrative we're looking for. This is the story we want to be a part of. We've talked about this in our exploration of the book of First Peter and how we're going to be ambassadors. And here, uh, in, in, in this prophetic tradition, Isaiah is adding to, to what Amos is having to say that this is our king. This is the government that we serve. This is the legacy that we get to be a part of. So church, may we be about the interests of this king and his interests, as it says here in Isaiah, are the interests of justice and righteousness under his reign. So let's be ambassadors of a better kingdom. And guys, what does it do to the world? Well, our orchardist prophet gives us this beautiful picture to close. Amos, our agricultural specialist, closes with this image of the hills dripping with wine and abundance, a harvest. So much of the prophetic hope of, of what Jesus comes to accomplish, of what God's redemptive agenda aims at, is the kind of abundance of the garden restored. And so it's no surprise that with the close of the canon in the book of Revelation, we have a picture of a garden city brimming with fruit and provision. And so may we, like Amos, see the rotten harvest of a broken world order. And may we, like Amos, look forward to and be about the ministry of reconciliation that brings into the world a better harvest. Godspeed, and may you be blessed by the ministry of this minor prophet from so long ago. As we align ourselves in the identity and the ministry of the very God he served. Let's find our prophetic voice and our prophetic hope. Godspeed.